So I'm gradually learning an important lesson as a Christian. It isn't always about me. In fact, the longer I come to understand what my Christianity is all about, the more I'm learning that it's almost never really about me. Hello, Father Sean from St. Edith's Celtic Catholic Church in Shelton, Washington. And today I get to talk with you about the readings for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. Those readings are Isaiah 45 verses 1 through 6, Psalm 96 verses 1 through 9, 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 1 through 5, and Matthew 22 verses 15 through 21. There is a tuna in my lap, and um, if, if he gets obst obstructive, just have to forgive me, I guess. Um, I tried to do this without a tuna in my lap, but it, it wasn't going to work. So, I'm going to read to you from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains, I will break in pieces the doors of bronze, and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob, and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So, a little bit of, of background Cyrus was uh, king uh, from Persia. Cyrus the second, he's called Cyrus the Great. And he conquered Babylon and became king of Babylon then. When he, when he did this, he um, issued a decree, so says the biblical story, saying that the Jews could return to Jerusalem at the instruction of God. God told him to let the Jews go home, and they took with them there the treasury of the temple, the vessels that were used in the sacrificial offerings in the temple that had been kidnapped along with them by, by the Babylonians. And with Cyrus's um, financial aid and other assistance, were able to begin rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. And science of the archaeology bears some of this out. There is a, a cylinder, a clay cylinder carved in cuneiform form letters that is a decree from, or meant, refers to a decree from Cyrus that he allowed when he when he became king of Babylon, he did allow certain of the captured peoples in Babylon to return with their gods, with the images of their gods. Um, certain peoples are mentioned specifically in that. Israel is not one of them. Um, and he does this, it says, at the command of Marduk, the god, the chief god of, of the Babylonians. Um, he allows the the images of the gods to return to their home um, territories and for their people to go with them. Um, you can say that there's no archaeological evidence of a decree commanding that the Jews be let go, but it, it um, fits with what is known that he did otherwise. And, um, and he let them go. He let them go. He let him go back home, and um, 
he let them take with him the vessels of the temple, and this was a cause of great rejoicing, because while they were in Babylon, they were utterly bereft of everything that they understood was important. They didn't have their land, and their land is where is where their meaning came from, where their identity came from. They didn't have their God, because they didn't really understand God at that time as a group. They didn't understand that God was everywhere. Um, it was typical for gods to be attached to the land, to the territory, and they didn't have the territory anymore. How could they really have God? Um, it must have been, and and was, we have you know the biblical record of it, it was a, a very depressing and confusing time for these people. So when Cyrus let them go home, it would have been cause of great rejoicing. Not only were they not going to be some kind of slaves anymore, but they were going to be re returning to their territory, to their identity, to the land that bore the name that they bore as a people. And they were going to return to the territory where their God lives. Now, of course, over time, they come to understand more and more about God, that God doesn't live in a territory. God doesn't live in Israel. Um, God doesn't live in the United States of America either. He doesn't live on planet Earth. I mean, he's everywhere, of course. He is in Israel. He is in the United States. He is on Earth. But that's not where he lives. That's not where he's localized. That's not where he's confined. We know that now, but they didn't know that then. They didn't understand. It took a long time to understand what God's really like. Okay? Don't think that they just, like, crossed the Red Sea and understood, because they didn't. And the Bible makes that very clear, that they had no idea what they were talking about when they were talking about God for, for a long time. We still don't know what we're talking about when we talk about God, because God is, God is much above any words you got. Any words you can come up with, God's bigger than those words. The, the point of all of this is, the Bible records that God addresses Cyrus and says, you are my anointed one, my Messiah, which is what anointed one means, my Christ. Um, the only non-Jew that scripture records that is referred to as God's anointed one, Messiah, Christ. You are my anointed one, and I'm going to I call you by name, and I'm going to do all these amazing things for you. I'm going to to go before you and and give you great victory. But he says, I'm doing it. He says, let's listen to this. He says, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen. This is why I will go before you and level the mountains and break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron and give you treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places. He's going to do all these things for Cyrus, but he's not going to do it for Cyrus's sake. He's using Cyrus as a tool to benefit um, his servant Jacob and Israel, his chosen. Cyrus is indeed being blessed greatly, but not for his sake. Okay. Now, St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake, We know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. And if you're a baptized Christian, at the very least, you have been chosen by God yourself. The church is chosen by God. The Thessalonians, to whom St. Paul is writing this, were 
chosen by God. He chose them, beloved, they're beloved, and he chose them. Wow, that's pretty amazing, right? God's got something special for them. He wants a wonderful, great things for them because they're special to him because he chose them because it's all about them, right? It's all about them, just like it's all about Cyrus, just like, just like it's all about Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I chose you. You're my Messiah. You're my chosen one. You're my Savior, my chosen Savior. Now go out there and make millions of dollars and get lots of, lots of, plays on YouTube and become influential and famous and live a long happy life with lots of children to follow you afterwards and everything you could possibly want or die on a cross and he didn't even die on the cross for himself he died on the cross for me would you want to die on a cross for me no I mean, I don't know, maybe you would. Maybe you're a really good person. I wouldn't want to die on a cross for me. But that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus was chosen for. And what was Cyrus chosen for? Cyrus was chosen to lead the, the children of Israel out of slavery into freedom, or deliver them out of slavery into freedom, back to their homeland, back to their temple. What am I, as a Christian, chosen for? Well, in that case, it really is just because I'm special and God loves me and he has great things planned for me. And he wants me to be eternally happy. And, you know, that's the end of the story, right? No. God has chosen me to use me as a tool for you. And I don't know who you are. I'm talking to a video camera. But he chose me for you and for the people whom I encounter, the people that I live with, the people that I work with, the people that I talk with, the people that are part of my community. He chose me. I am his anointed one was anointed with the oil in confirmation, in ordination. I was baptized into his son, the Christ. I'm chosen, but I'm not chosen for me any more than Cyrus was chosen for Cyrus's sake. I'm chosen for the sake of those whom God chooses to bless through me. I'm chosen to be God's instrument. And so, my friend, are you. I have no idea if God has great and glorious happy plans for you. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I couldn't care less. Um, I do know for a fact that he wants to use you to cause great and glorious happy plans for somebody else. I know that. Okay, Cyrus, you got your blessings, now go out and do your job. You got your blessings. You've had your mountains plowed down in front of you. You've had the treasuries of darkness opened up for you. You've gotten your blessings. Now go out there and find out who it is you're supposed to bless and bless them. In Jesus' name, go bless them. Amen. Mm -hmm.